I find that、um, even today, unfortunately, there are engineers that will spend six months trying to pursue a particular direction,、uh, such as collect more data because we heard more data is valuable. But sometimes you could run some tests, could have figured out six months earlier that for this particular problem, collecting more data isn't going to cut it. So just don't spend six months collecting more data. Spend your time mod modifying the architecture or trying something else. So it's an evolving discipline. But I find that the people that are really good at debugging machine learning algorithms are easily ten x. Maybe 100x faster at getting something to work. We're never going to learn programming by watching a video. The only way to learn programming, I think, and the only one is the only way everyone I've ever met who can program well、yeah. learned it all in the same way. They had something they wanted to do, and then they tried to do it, and then they were like, "Oh, well, okay, this is kind of you know, it'd be nice if the computer could kind of do this thing." And then you know, that's how you learn. You just keep pushing on a project. <laughs> um, so the only advice I have for learning programming is go program. It's often not about the burst of sustained efforts and the all nighters because you can only do that a limited number of times. It's the sustained effort over a long time. I think you know reading two research papers is a nice thing to do, but the power is not reading two research papers. It's reading two research papers a week for a year. Then you read a hundred papers, and and you actually learn a lot when you read a hundred papers. Beginners are often focused on what to do, and I think the focus should be more like how much you do. So I, I am kind of like believer on a high level in this ten、uh, thousand hours kind of concept, where you just kind of have to just pick the things where you can spend time and you you care about and you're interested in. You literally have to put in ten thousand hours of work. It doesn't even like matter as much like where you put it, and you you'll iterate and you'll improve and you'll waste some time. But I think it's actually really nice because I feel like there's some sense of determinism about being an expert at a thing if you spend ten thousand hours. You can literally pick an arbitrary thing, and I think if you spend ten thousand hours. Of deliberate effort and work, you actually will become an expert at it. One thing I still do when I'm trying to study something really deeply is、uh, take handwritten notes. We know that that act of taking notes, preferably handwritten notes, increases retention. Taking handwritten notes it causes you to recode the knowledge in your own words more, and that process of recoding promotes long-term retention. I heard machine learning is important. Could you help us integrate machine learning with macaroni and cheese production? You just—I don't even—you can't help these people. Like, who lets you run anything? Who lets that kind of person run anything? My problem is not that they don't know about machine learning. My problem is that they think that machine learning has something to say about macaroni and cheese production. Right? Like, I heard about this new technology. How can I use it for why? At least start with tell me about a problem. Like if you have a problem, you're like, you know, some of my boxes aren't getting enough macaroni in them.、Um, can we use machine learning to solve this problem?、Yeah. That's much much better than how do I apply machine learning to macaroni and cheese? He tweeted, "When you have the choice between being a creator, consumer, or redistributor, always go for creation. When you have the choice to create something, always go for creation. It's so much more satisfying, and it also this is what life is about. I think the field of AI has been in a state of childhood, and now it's exiting that state and it's entering a state of maturity. What that means is that AI is very successful and also very impactful." And its impact is not only large, but it's also growing. And so, for that reason, it seems wise to start thinking about the impact of our systems before releasing them. Maybe a little bit too soon, rather than a little bit too late. Try to get interested by big questions, things like what is intelligence, what is the universe made of, what's life all about, things like that. Like even like crazy big questions, like what's time? Like nobody knows what time is. And then learn basic things, like basic methods, either from math, from physics, or from engineering. Things that have a long shelf life. Like if you have a choice between learning,、uh, you know, mobile programming on iPhone or quantum mechanics, take quantum mechanics. Because you're going to learn things that you have no idea exist. You may never be a quantum physicist, but you'll learn about path integrals. And path integrals are used everywhere. Learn statistical physics because all the math that comes out for machine learning basically comes out by statistical physicists in the you know late 19th, early 20th century. Right. I love giving talks to the next generation. What I say to them is actually two things. I,、uh, I think the most important things to learn about、uh, and, and to find out about when you're when you're young is what are your true passions. Is first of all, there's two things. So one is find. Your true passions, and I think the way to do that is to explore as many things as possible when you're young, and you, you can take those risks.、Um, I would also encourage people to look at the finding the connections between things、uh, in a unique way. I think that's a really great way to find a passion. Second thing I would say, advise is know yourself. So spend a lot of time understanding how you work best. Like, what are the optimal times to work? What are the optimal ways that you study? What are your? How do you deal with pressure?
better. Um, sort of test yourself in various scenarios and um, try and improve your weaknesses, but also find out what your unique skills and strengths are and then hone those. So then that's what your, will be your super value in the world later on. The key fact about deep learning before deep learning started to be successful is that it was underestimated. People didn't believe that large neural networks could be trained. The ideas were all there. The thing that was missing was a lot of supervised data and a lot of compute. Once you have a lot of supervised data and a lot of compute, then there is a third thing which is needed as well, and that is conviction. Conviction that if you take the right stuff, which already exists, and apply and mix it with a lot of data and a lot of compute, that it will in fact work. And so that was the missing piece. It was you had the, you needed the, the data, you needed the compute, which showed up in terms of GPUs, and you needed the conviction to realize that you need to mix them together. I would say re-implement everything on different levels of abstraction in some sense, but I would say re-implement something from scratch, re-implement something from a paper, re-implement something, you know, from podcasts that you have heard about. I would say that's a powerful way to understand things. So it's often the case that you read the description and you think you understand, but you truly understand when once you build it, then you actually know what really mattered in the description. If someone who's a student considering a career in AI, like takes a little while, sits down and thinks like, what do I really want to see? What do I want to see a machine do? What do I want to see a natural language system? And then actually sit down and think about the steps that are necessary to get there. And hopefully that thing is not a better number on ImageNet classification. It's like, it's probably like an actual thing that we can't do today that would be really awesome. And I think that thinking about that and then backtracking from there and imagining the steps needed to get there will actually lead to much better research. It'll lead to working on the bottlenecks that other, other people aren't working on. Uh, deep learning has been kind of looked at with suspicion by a lot of computer scientists because the math is very different. The math that uh, you use for deep learning, you know, kind of has more to do with, you know, cybernetics, uh, the kind of math you do in electrical engineering than the, the kind of math you do in computer science. And nothing in, in machine learning is exact, right? Computer science is all about obviously compulsive attention to details of like, you know, every index has to be right and you can prove that an algorithm is correct, right? Uh, machine learning is the, the science of sloppiness. And so the big idea is the cost function. The cost function is a way of measuring the performance of the system according to some measure. I'm a big fan of cost functions. I think cost functions are great and they serve us really well. And I think that whenever we can do things with cost functions, we should. And, you know, maybe there is a chance that we will come up with some yet another profound way of looking at things that will involve cost functions in a less central way. But I don't know. I think cost functions are, I mean, I would not bet against cost functions. The fact that you can build gigantic neural nets, train, that, train them on, you know, relatively small amounts of data, relatively, with stochastic gradient descent, and that it actually works. Uh, breaks everything you read in every textbook, right? Every pre-deep learning textbook that told you you need to have fewer parameters and you have data samples. You know, all those things that you read in textbook and they tell you stay away from this, and they're all wrong. It was kind of obvious to me before I knew anything that this was a good idea. And then it became surprising that it worked because I started reading those textbooks. <laughs> okay. Wait, so, okay. So, like, so you can know, you talk through the intuition of why it was obvious to you if you remember? Well, okay. So the intuition was it's, it's sort of like, you know, those people in the late 19th century who proved that heavier than air uh, flight was impossible. And of course you have birds, right? They do fly. And so we have the same kind of thing that we know that the brain works. We don't know how, but we know it works. And we know it's a large network of of neurons and interaction and that learning takes place by changing the connections. So kind of getting this level of inspiration without copying the details, but sort of trying to derive basic principles is also the idea somehow that I've, I've been convinced of since I was an undergrad, that, that intelligence is inseparable from learning. The idea somehow that you can create an intelligent machine by basically programming, for me, was a non-starter you know, from the start. Every intelligent entity that we know about arrives at this intelligence through learning. You wrote a blog post a few years ago titled how to be successful it's so succinct it's so brilliant compound yourself have almost too much self-belief learn to think independently get good at sales and quotes make it easy to take risks focus work hard be bold be willful be hard to compete with build a network you get rich by owning things be internally driven what stands out to you from that or beyond as advice you can give yeah no i think it is like good advice in some sense but i also think it's way too tempting to take advice from other people. And the stuff that worked for me, which I tried to write down there, probably may not work as well for other people. And I think I mostly got what I wanted by ignoring advice. <laughs> and I tell people not to listen to too much advice. Listening to advice from other people should be approached with great caution.